Thanks, Nigel. It's really good to uh, be welcomed. Uh, morning, everyone. It's really good to be here. Now, we're going to be speaking on the book of Ruth, which is one of the most amazing books in all of Scripture. And uh, we're going to look at that, and we're looking at it under the title of Hope for the Hurting. It's a, a book that has tremendous hope for us. No matter what you've been through, no matter what you're experiencing right now, there's a God who can make the end of our story something that comes from tragedy to triumph, from hope, lessness to hope. But um, before we do that, I wanted to share a little video. Um, as Nigel said, Kate and I, we help lead Metro in We the Curious. And uh, we have tonight some more baptisms. We baptized 18 people last year. We've got another baptism, first baptism of the year this evening. We're baptizing four guys. I wanted to show two of their stories with you because essentially their story is a story of friendship and faith. And that is exactly what is happening in the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth is about friendship. It's about how we as friends can bring faith to those who've lost it, those who are hurting. So I want you to uh, watch this video. I, I can't tell you how much I love those stories. I love the story of a girl who's been coming to church for just four months, where before she had no faith and no connection, and she says, it's made me realize I am. And I can remember filming this and thinking, what is she going to say? I had no idea what she was going to say. She took her time, she chose her words, and then she said, it made me realize that I am amazing, always, to Jesus. If I never hear another testimony for the rest of the year, that one will keep me going for a long, long time. When people discover Jesus, they discover that they are amazing always to Jesus. If you're here today, you don't know Jesus, or you've maybe started to fray at the edges in your faith, you need to know that coming into his arms, you discover you're amazing always to Jesus. But it makes me ask the question, why don't we see more people experiencing that? In a moment, we're going to share communion together. We're going to share the most amazing expression of love that any human being can ever enter into. The God himself would have his body broken for us, his blood spilled for us, that we might know him, that we are amazing to him always. Why? Why don't more people know this? Why aren't more people kept? Motivated by this. Why in Bristol, for every one person that is connected to a church, there are 20 people disconnected? When we come to the students, the 50,000 students within our city, when every one person is connected to church, 99 are disconnected. Here's a question for you, and uh, don't put your hands up, but I'll answer it in your own mind. What do you think is the number one reason why people don't believe in God in Britain today? What do you think the research shows? Why is it that people don't believe? And here, if you are, again, here slightly on the outside looking in, you're not sure about belief in God, then what is it for you? You see, sometimes people will think, well, maybe they think that the church is full of hypocrites. Actually, research shows that the church, it has its problems, but we have a kind of, it's, it's not the biggest issue. You know, with uh, Pope Francis, with Justin Welby, we have leaders in the church that people are starting to respect. Some people think, well, maybe people don't believe because it's not scientific, because they live in a rational mindset. Actually, that's not the biggest reason. Do you know what the biggest reason is that people don't believe in God in the UK today? What do you think it is? Suffering. Suffering. How can God be real when I suffer? How can there be a loving God when my life has experienced hurt and heartache? When I look upon the world and I see a world that is riven with discord, disharmony, disunity, when we see terrorism striking at even the most innocent, when we see school children in America gunned down in their classrooms, when we see a disparity between the rich, the have and the have not, how can there be a God? How can there be a God when my heart was broken? How can there be a God when he left and walked out the door? How can there be a God when I have felt these tears and I've felt this pain? The story of Ruth is really the story of Naomi. It's a story of a woman who finds herself caught in the hurt, in the vice-like grip of tragedy and disillusionment. It's an amazing book, and if you want to understand it, one of the best keys into this book, which was written over 3,000 years ago, 
is to look at the names. Now, in the UK today, in our culture, names don't really mean much. They're just nice things that people give you, your parents give you names. But in the culture that Ruth is written in, names meant something. Every now and again in the UK, someone will have a name and it will actually be very apposite to what they are. When I first met Kate, she was working for a company called Logica. She was a PA. She had three bosses that she was uh, answerable to. And I kid you not, their names were Mr. Fail, Mr. Tidy, and Mr. Careless. <laughs> True story. Gets even better. Mr. Fail was sacked. Mr. Tidy married the cleaner. <laughs> Mr. Careless was married to Mrs. Careless, who left the frying pan on and burnt the house down. When I tell people that, they never believe me. They think it's a gag. It's one of the curses of being a preacher. People don't believe you when you tell them things that are true. They think you're exaggerating. It's absolutely true. You can talk to Kate. You believe Kate. You don't believe me. You believe Kate. So the name Naomi, it means pleasant. It's an aspirational name. It's a name of hope. It's a name of calling. It's a name of destiny. It means that she was given a name from the earliest moment that she entered the world. Your life is to be pleasant. You're a child of God. God wants good things for you. God wants pleasing things for you. God wants you to experience the best. God wants you to experience happiness. God wants you to experience fulfillment. Your name, your destiny, your calling is pleasant. She married a man called Elimelech. His name means God is my king. You're supposed to live with God as the boss. You're supposed to live with God calling the shots. You're supposed to live the way that God wants you to live, fulfilling his commandments. As Nigel said to us at the beginning, commandments are good, they're for our benefit. God is my king. That's my destiny. That's my calling. That's my, my position towards the world, that I live everything that I do, all my choices, all my decisions. Every action is dictated by that one single truth. God is my king. But this is a couple who lose their way. It may be that you're here this morning and you know the destiny, the calling that you have, but somehow you may have lost your way too. They find themselves living in their hometown of Bethlehem in Judah. Suddenly famine hits. Where's God when you can't feed your family? They have two boys, Marlon and Kilion. Maybe because of the famine they name them Marlon and Kilion. Marlon means sickly. Kilion means pining. And so instead of trusting God, instead of living like God is my king, they give up hope, they lose hope, they cross the river Jordan, they move into the territory of the Moabites. It's now present day Jordan. I'm going to be there in a couple of months. And they find a new life there. They marry their children off to Moabite women, which again was expressly forbidden by God in the commandments. Don't give your sons to marry foreign women because they'll turn your hearts away. Don't serve the foreign gods in Moab. They serve the god Chemosh. Chemosh means destroyer. When they worshipped Chemosh, they sacrificed their children to this demon god. And this family, once pleasant, once with God as king, find themselves in an idol-worshipping culture. They marry these two girls, their sons to the two girls. Two girls, Orpah and Ruth. Orpah means doe, gazelle, or fawn. Ruth means friendship. But the tragedy that they fled from follows them all the way across the Jordan, follows them right into enemy-occupied territory. And Elimelech dies. And then Marlon and Kilion dies. Orpah and Ruth are left bereaved. They turn to one another. Orpah says, listen, I married a man called Sickly. You married a man called Pining. They both died. How did we not see this coming? And yet there is this tragedy. And so... Naomi says, listen, you don't get to call me Naomi, because that's a sick joke. You don't call me pleasant because my life is not pleasant. Don't say that things are good for me because things are not good for me. My life is not pleasant. I'm not Naomi, I'm Mara. Mara means bitter. My life tastes bitter. My experience is bitter. The life that I have had has turned bitter. It should have been pleasant. That's what I was promised. But it's bitter and I've lost all hope. She plays the God card. She says, I believe there's a God, but I believe it doesn't care for me. 
Because if he cared for me, then he would have made my life pleasant. He would have fulfilled the promises that he gave me. But instead, I find that all I have in my mouth is bitterness. And so she goes back, leaving all hope. And at the border between Moab and uh, Judah, she says to her sisters-in-law, she says, listen, you go home. There's no hope. There's no hope. There's no hope. This is what uh, Ruth chapter 1 says. But Naomi said, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband, even if I thought there was still hope for me. Even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this, they wept aloud again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, even if death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. This is a story of someone helping another person find faith. And what makes it all the more remarkable is that the person losing faith is the person that was connected to God, one of God's people, one of the chosen people, an Israelite. And the person that's helping them find faith, helping them discover faith once again, is an outsider, a Gentile, a demon idol worshipper. Somehow God is able to be so sovereign that even someone that is way outside of the faith, that should have no chance, a Muhammad, of finding faith in the one true God, finds faith and begins to encourage her mother-in-law. See, what happens with Naomi is that she loses hope. She loses hope. And when you lose hope, you cannot find faith. Because faith needs to be built on a foundation and a basis of hope. If I've got hope that there is good in the world, if I've got hope that God is kind and loving and gracious, then I can start to believe in him. I can have faith to look for him. And when I find him, then I will experience him. When the Bible says the greatest things that you can ever have of faith, hope, and love. There's a reason for that. Because if I love somebody, I help them find hope. And if they find hope, then they can find faith. And through faith, they can experience God's love and then share that with others who can then find hope, faith, and love. And the story of Ruth is a woman who loves, loves against the odds, loves in a committed way. You see, you have to ask yourself the question, which daughter-in-law am I like? Am I like Orpah, fawn, or am I like Ruth, friend? Fawns are beautiful. Fawns are delicate. Fawns are lovely. Fawns are creatures of wonder and delight. But Orpah as a fawn is able to kiss her mother-in-law and then walk away. But Ruth, equally lovely, equally uh, together, there's something about her committed friendship. Instead of just kissing and then walking, she cleaves. There's no greater word in the whole book of Ruth than that word cleave. Cleave is one of the oldest words in the Bible. We find that in Genesis chapter 2 when God says, therefore a man will leave his family and he will cleave to his wife and they will become one flesh. It means to cling on to, to cleave on to. It is the most loving word. It's a word of commitment. It's the word that sums up what Jesus Christ has done in coming down to earth. It's an incarnational word because God says to us as human beings, he says, I'm not just going to kiss you. I'm not just going to come close to you. I'm not just going to have a superficial surface relationship with you. I I'm going to come and I am going to cling and I'm going to cleave to you in the midst of your hurt, in the midst of your pain. Your people will be my people. Your tribe will be my tribe. Your flesh, your very flesh will be my flesh. The immortal clothed 
in mortality. The omnip- omnipresent, omnipotent God, weak and clothed in humanity. And he says, where you go, I will go. And when you die, I will die. I will cling to you, cleave to you, and give my life. That's what this communion is. It's God saying, this is my heart for you. I cling on to you. I will not let you go. Where you've lost hope, I will love you back to hope. You see, some people think that in order to win another person for Jesus, that they've got to have all the answers. Ah, wrong They think that they've got to be theologically equipped. doesn't hurt, but that's not the answer. That's not the key. And Ruth herself, as a Moabitess, she had none of the theology. She had none of the background. But she knew enough to love, to know that God is loving, that God who's called you to be a person whose life is pleasant has not yet finished with you. And even though you have made mistakes and though you have taken a wrong turn, he is still ready to embrace you, to cleave to you, to cling to you. You don't need to know very much. You just need to love people. Part of the work that I do, I work for Care for the Family, and I get to um, work alongside some amazing speakers. One of them, Rob Parsons, tells a story about a a church in America. There's one particular uh, incident. A young man who was a hell's angel was dared by his friends. Go into that church. Freak him out. This guy is a hell's angel, and he was intimidating. He was imposing. He had the whole look And he had the whole persona, he had the piercings, he had the tattoos, most egregious of which he had tattoos on his knuckles. On this hand, he had four words, a four-letter word, starting in F. You you get the picture. Uh, F on that hand, U on this hand. A disaster. He walks in, dead by his friends, not just sitting in the church, sitting on the very front row. Fortunately for him, he sits in the row in the section of Marge Staples. This is a church where every section is allocated a welcomer, someone whose job it is is to love people. Marge Staples, she just loves people. She's nearly 90 years old. She's seen it all. She's not intimidated by his leathers and she's not intimidated by his tattoo. She doesn't care. She knows she's going to be with Jesus soon enough. All she wants to do is love him. She sees him, she walks up to him, she approaches him, she says, oh, young man, come here, let me hug you. (laughs) She clings. She feels the piercings in his cheek pressing into her cheek. And then she feels something else. Hot tear dribbling down. That young man, he cries and he cries because love opens up hope where there has been hurt. He does not stop crying until the preacher stops preaching, and then he gives his life to Jesus. A few weeks later, they're baptizing him, thanks to the ministry and the love of Marge Staples. And uh, the most unusual sight, they baptize a man with plastic bags around his hands with elastic bands holding them in place. He needs his hands to be protected so that when he goes under the water, the water doesn't get his hands because he's just been operated on. A plastic surgeon in the church has volunteered his services to give him skin grafts to remove the offending words from his knuckles. Not because the church had a massive problem with them, but quite frankly, he was offending people when he worshipped. <laughs> you don't need big qualifications. You just need to love people. And that idea and that picture of this young man being baptized, it brings us back to where we came in with baptisms. And tonight we'll be baptizing Lucy and Beth and Ben and Dan. What I didn't tell you about these two, I, I, I am so, please pray for us. I'm so excited because tonight we're going to see something which I don't think I've seen before. Um, Lucy is going to Lucy's going to baptize Beth. And then she's going to get into the tank herself. And we're going to baptize her. And the best thing is, Lucy and Beth are on the same course. And do you know what their course is? They're midwives. They brought many of their course mates 
to church. We now have something like one third of all the midwives sitting in Bristol. <laughs> it's so appropriate because that's what God has called us to be. That we don't produce the life, but we help it come to birth. And tonight, as they step into that pool, as they baptize one another, it's not so much a baptistry as it is a birthing pool. God calls us to be people that love, that cling, that simply allow the love of Jesus to come through us to bring hope to people who have lost it. You don't abandon yourself to consumerism and drugs and drink because of the fun of it. You do it because you have no other hope, no other vision, no other possibility of seeing something that will make your life worth living. But when we introduce hope, people find faith, and then they know the love of God. So we're going to pray right now. And what I want you to do is this. I want you just to close your eyes. And I want you to just picture the place where you're most emotionally invested, and where you're most surrounded by people outside of church. It may be your work, it may be your community, your street, it may be your, your group of friends. But I want you to imagine that situation, and I want you to just ask God right now to highlight to you one face, one person. And this is the question for you. Will you be Ruth? To that person will you be a friend not simply a fawn that looks great that kisses and then walks on but a friend that embraces that commits that clings hold of another person and says listen I know you have known pain I've known pain too I know that you have been hurt I have been hurt too but I want you to have hope that there is a God who loves you. And as you picture that person, I want you to just commit yourself to that person, to pray for them, to ask God to give you opportunities to invite them. Every single one of the people, every single one of the people we're baptizing tonight has done an Alpha course here in the last six months. You could invite your friend. You could bring them along with you. Ask God to give you the faith to pray for them when they say that they're sick or when they're hurting. And say, God, make me a midwife. Give me the spirit of Marge Staples. Make me Ruth. To turn someone's bitterness back to pleasant. Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would allow us a fresh vision of what you can do with us. Unlikely people, but powerful in your hands. I pray, dear God, that you would send us out to those that you have placed us next to. That we would be able to show them love as you show us love. I pray, Lord God, that you'd help us to restore hope for the hurting. That they might find faith in you. And Lord, as we take the symbols of bread and wine, would you allow us to share that good news in love and actions and deeds to those around us in Jesus' name, that we might see many, 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 many more people coming to faith in you. In Jesus' name, amen.